Good afternoon, folks. Gonna be doing this outside today. <laughs> you'll probably hear some birds chirping. Maybe in the distance, maybe you'll hear landscapers cutting grass at my neighbors and so my new page as I walk towards the chair. <laughs> How are you doing? Are you doing good today? I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. I had such a restful night last night. We went to the the shooting range last night, me and my two oldest boys. Put several hundred rounds through our well mostly my my handguns, but my my son Caleb, he brought his Glock and that was his first time taking it to the range. So it was interesting to see him cowboy up. <laughs> but anyway. It's a beautiful day out here today, by the way. I hope it's nice where you are. I, I generally do these very long, long-winded Twitter spaces. And this one has the potential, or could be, one of those that could go for like six to eight hours. I could go on and on and on. But I'm kind of like introducing some ideas that I have in my first of three books. Uh, some of the things, obviously, you know, I taught in great detail in the past, and you can find all that information on my YouTube channel. So for the folks that are here that like to say, oh, see, he's plugging a book now. He's plugging a book. Well, I am going to write a book. I'm writing four of them. Three of them are all technical, and they expound on the things that are on my YouTube channel, but you don't need to know anything more. Once they were added to the YouTube channel, I mean, if you just work with that, never buy the book or books from me, you'll be fine. You don't need it. But it's just for the folks that just simply want to know more. Okay, so, or want to have something nostalgia, you know, 20 years from now, and I'm probably no longer here or whatever. <laughs> you say, I, I got his book, and I heard him talking about this stuff real time when it was being re released to the public. But one of the chapters in Volume 1 is time-based setups and models. And I kind of like want to just broad brush some ideas and conceptual views on price action that I want to instill in your thought process as an analyst or a trader in the making. Even if you're experienced as a trader, if you are uh, profitable, if you trade with other approaches and such, and you just like to listen to me, maybe not necessarily use my content or my ideas. Uh, these are ideas that I think will complement every other form of trading so that way everyone can put down their pitchforks and torches and not try to come at me because i always tell everybody that what i teach is the market everything else is subpar uh, this this idea of time uh, time and price theory it started with me when i was listening to ken roberts which was which was the first person i, I looked at as a mentor in trading and let me make it very clear he didn't teach me anything that was profitable okay so uh, i'm not suggesting he's someone to go and chase after he, he doesn't even do anything with trading anymore but he produced this course or book if you want to call it and then build on it and it was more or less like an introduction to trading and if my memory serves me correct he really had a business plan with specific broker so he was like an introducing broker that he sold a book and course around and i'm sure he got kickbacks from the brokers because i was paying a hundred dollars round term per contract like everyone else back in the 90s and 80s it was very very expensive to take trades back then and it wasn't until trader brokerage firms like lindwall dock and the equivalent we would have what would be considered then discount brokers where you would pay 35 dollars or 30 dollars per contract and today, you know, hearing that, you're probably cringing, thinking, man, <laughs> that's expensive. It was, which meant that you had to be very selective in your trading. You had to be selective in your engagements to any particular market. And you had to really know what you were looking for. Otherwise, you know, just the commissions alone and draw down through, you know, the slippage that occurred would compound over trade after trade and a break even trader couldn't even survive back then it would just be a matter of time before you were gone today you have all the advantages of having very very low cost 
commissions and or spreads. And I know some of you complain about that. Oh, this spread's too high. You're spoiled. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely spoiled. You have no idea what it was like to trade 30 years ago. You, you have no idea, no, no conceptual appreciation for the advantages that you have today. So uh, when you have this inclination to want to complain about how the industry is this and that, you have such a wonderful, cheap, inexpensive approach to getting in this industry. Whereas, you know, back then it was a lot more expensive. So time is a crucial factor in consistency, longevity, and success. Meaning that you, you need to know what you're looking for. Why do the setups or why should the setups form? What's the basis or premise behind the setups? Like what makes your trade idea that you're about to take or what you're stalking or hunting, what makes it viable? Is it something that's, you know, built on your impulsive tendencies to just look for something? Or is it rooted in something that's sound and logic? I want to touch on a couple things in this discussion. I don't believe we're going to go very long. And I usually say that in the past and we go for hours and hours, but I don't want to kill the, the gems in this particular chapter, but I want to kind of give you an idea of like, what is it I'm going to be talking about in these books? Kind of like bringing together all the conceptual ideas I've taught and even my own older students, uh, they have been, made aware of and I've taught some things with them as well but taking these conceptual ideas and making them into a model you know I could I've said this many times in the past I, I could make a model every single day 365 days a year and they would all be uniquely different from one another all using the content that's already on my YouTube channel now that sounds like an exaggeration but I assure you it's not because what you think a model is right now, if you're new, or you have a trading model that already makes money for you, and maybe you've been trading before, finding me, discovering me, or parking yourself down into a Twitter space like this for the first time, and you may think, well, you know, I have a trading plan, I have this, I have that, I look for all these things that come in the agreement, and therefore I now look for a trade entry. And, well, that's wonderful. Uh, you're not my audience, but you're welcome to be here and sit in and, you know, share some time together. My audience is the individual that has been introduced to the idea of my order block theory, my fair value gap. Now, like since February, the the interest in new week opening gaps, new day opening gaps, breakers, and all the other PD arrays that you've been made aware of. And you probably feel like there's probably one better than the rest. I want to learn that one. If ICT could just sit down in a Twitter space or do a YouTube presentation or do a live stream and say, okay, if I were going to just tell you the best of the best and get right down to the nitty gritty where the rubber meets the road, this is the only thing that you would ever need to do <laughs> that doesn't exist because they're all equally effective to me. Now, from a mentor's perspective, I found that certain PD arrays and certain particular models are a little bit easier, more palatable for students, whether there have been a long duration of time spending you know, under my wing as an educator or if they just recently discovered me in like 21 or 22 or, or this year. And that being like the 2022 model and now the silver bullet that I released on Twitter. And I have a lecture coming for that as well. As a reminder, I have a, a lecture for the New Week Opening Gap that'll be on YouTube channel tonight at 10 p.m. And on tomorrow, Sunday, May 7th, 2023, I'll have a presentation for New Day Opening Gap. And someday this week, I don't know how my schedule is going to allow me to do it, but I'll have the Silver Bullet AM and PM session model so that way you can have the rules for that and go off and have some fun with that as well. What is a time-based need or influence in trading? Well, let's think about it like this. Maybe you have a job right now. Maybe you have a, a job that you go to and or maybe you're older and you've retired or maybe trading has been 
a, an allowance for you to no longer have to work anymore. But you know what it was like to be in rush hour traffic, right? Uh, in the States, in the United States, uh, we have generally two times of the day where it's considered rush hour. And you, you don't want to be on the busy highways and byways because they'll be congested. They are typically in the morning, 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning. And in the evening time or afternoon, it's 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Those two hours in both morning and evening session, if you're looking at traffic like trading, uh, that is scheduled congestion. That's, that's scheduled volume. You can set a clock to it. You know it's going to be there. And if you travel like I like to do, uh, I don't fly. I used to fly. I don't fly anymore. I was told not to do so, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> And I'll let you figure out what that means, but uh, I'm not going up in the air. I have no business going up there anymore. But the idea is this. You can set a clock to volume in trading as well, just like traffic. You know when rush hour in the morning is going to occur. You know where rush hour is in the afternoon. Well, the same thing occurs in trading. And I want you to think about the importance of knowing when there is going to be scheduled volume inflows. What does that mean? Certain times of the day, there is a reasonable expectation that there's going to be a lot of interest to be trading. That's at the beginning of the trading sessions, being like London, New York session AM, or for Forex traders, New York open kill zone, and or the London closed session for Forex traders, or the lunch hour for index trading. And then you have the PM session, which is two o'clock to four o'clock. So you can anticipate setups that will form within those little specific time windows. Now, as an educator, every time I have ever released something new, if we were to look at the flock, the herd, if you will, that follows any educator, and we're going to talk about just me in this instance, whenever I release something new, okay, or if I share something that builds on more understanding about a particular asset or a model or a PDA, right? Something that gets everybody excited. It's almost like they want to forget everything that they've already learned and they only want to just do that. This is the thing that he's been holding out this long. Now he's releasing this. This is the, the magic bullet. Okay. You've been taught the silver bullet. Now this is the magic bullet, whatever they, I'm obviously speaking rhetorically. And unfortunately, that's not a good thing. And it may not feel like it's a good thing at the time. It feels like the right thing because impulsiveness in humans is what it is. You feel like that this is the thing you're looking for. This is the thing I've been looking for all this time. And that may be true for some of you. Some of you, when you get to that 2022 model that are, in my opinion, are very simple rules that lead to a consistent setup. That is very easy to see. It's conceptually pleasing because it doesn't demand a lot of moving parts. It's rule-based. And as long as you can see where liquidity is above old highs or below old lows, and you have a bias, something on a higher time frame basis, you can use that model and be very consistent with it. And once the trade pans out, you stop and there's nothing else to think about, nothing else to worry about. The problem is, some of you aren't content with that and you want more, 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 more. And I want to kind of like pull you back, okay? Pulling the reins on you because you get a little too wild sometimes. You want to do more than what's necessary. And time helps control that. So what do we mean by that? In the beginning of your trading, when you're looking for consistency and continuity in your trading and not over trading, not being impulsive, not trying to react to price. You want to be anticipating it. Okay, professional traders, they are not surprised by the events in market action. They're not. I know that sounds impossible. I know that sounds like, you know, come on, nobody knows this stuff, ICT. Nobody can know it in advance. Well, around here we do. And my students prove it without me holding them. I'm, they're trading markets. I don't even trade anymore. And they're doing exceedingly well. So that means they've learned this concept, this mindset, this approach to trading, and they're independently doing it apart from me. 
So you can join the ranks. That's the, that's the very thing I'm doing here is trying to make you an independent thinking and price action engaging trader. So that way you're not needing me to handhold you. I don't want to do that. I don't do that. And I don't sugarcoat anything. It's going to be a lot of effort for you to figure out what your model is. And unfortunately, there is no mold to press you into. If it was, I could be turning out traders like this every day. <laughs> but unfortunately, the factors that bring with trading as a human being, you have character flaws. And you have to limit the exposure in these charts and these markets because your natural impulses, which are always going to be negative, the negative is going to overwhelm the few times that you are in the beginning doing the right things at the right time. And it only takes a small series of events that you did wrong with a mindset that was incorrectly, well, focusing on things that aren't that big of a deal. Worrying about which model is better. This guy's posting that he got a, a payout from this company. And he's you know, doing it consistently. What's he doing or what is she doing that I'm not doing? Well, they're minding their own business, number one. They're doing what it is that matches their personality. And I've said this before. And when I first heard this idea expressed by Larry Williams, he had a keynote speaking engagement that I had a VHS tape of. In the 90s. And when I first heard him talk about it. It just went over my head like. That's not interesting. Give me an entry pattern. <laughs> Much like some of you. And that's why I get it. I understand that people that will say. You talk too much. Get to the point. Because what you want is. Give me the easy one, two, three entry pattern. That's going to work most of the time. Which means at always. And it never has a losing trade. And I'm going to be able to. Over leverage because it will work and I can trust that I can over leverage the maximum amount of contracts that my broker will allow me or my funded account company will allow me to trade. And then I'll be able to get these five figure, six figure payouts and I can go on social media and I can act like a, you know, a warrior and call everybody out and do this and do that. And I can make a name for myself. And that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen, folks. You need to have this same approach or mindset about trading that you do with traffic. If you were going to go away on a trip and you were doing a road trip driving, are you going to plan your departure during the peak of rush hour traffic? No, you're not. When would you likely do it? Well, before it, before it happens, that way you can get through the congested scheduled traffic jams around high congested cities. And then when you get past it, the same thing. After the lunch hour, or I'm sorry, after the, the rush hour of nine o'clock in the morning in the States, wherever you are, there's traffic, yes, but it's not congested or, or, or bunched up. You can have a, a pretty easy movement from one location to the next, unless there's an accident or something like that. Well, that same thing should be applied to your trading. Do you want to go in at the very opening of Say, for instance, 9.30 a.m. If you're brand new to trading, you don't, you don't know what you're doing. That's equivalent to you being a new driver. Do you want to be going out there over the speed limit, texting while you're driving, in rush hour? What's that recipe for? Disaster. Okay, I got a guy over here cutting a tree down, so that's not going to sound good on this recording. So let's take it inside here. Some of you are like, I don't care. Just talk. <laughs> and others are like, yeah, we don't like these birds chirping, dude. Give me a second. Give me some edit work for those that want to put these up on their YouTube channel. <laughs> All right. So you don't want to schedule your trading if you're brand new at the very opening like the first minute or two of trading, because you know that now everybody's in there dogpiling in to take trades. So you think everybody in there is going to be pushing the market up because of their buying pressure, or they're going to be sending the market lower because of their selling pressure. And again, that's all misinformation that you're all trying to do something at their incorrect time. And that compounds the likelihood of you wrecking 
just like in traffic as a new driver. You don't do all those high speed maneuvers when you're inexperienced. You don't distract yourself with social media during your driving or in your trading. That means keeping up with everybody else. You need to be minding your own business and watching where you're traveling. When you're driving, years and years ago, they taught defensive driving. It was called the Smith system. And I learned a lot of defensive driving skills that really find their way in my teaching as an educator in price action. You may not realize it, but it has a lot of sound logic. You don't want to be reacting to the drivers around you. Now, obviously, we, we would have to. In price action, you don't want to be reacting to the knee-jerk reactions in you know, lower time frames because you could be convincing yourself rather quickly. Oh, it's not going to do what I thought it was going to do. Let me do this because now this one minute chart or this five minute chart has done this or that. The same thing with driving. You need to be anticipating not only what you're going to do if this or that happens, but you have to drive the cars around you. As a CDL driver, you have to learn to anticipate when they're not going to come over into your lane without signaling. And it's probably a game you probably played in your own driving. You know, you're thinking, okay, because I'll, I'll tell my wife all the time, I say, well, what's this guy up here? He's going to come over. He's not going to signal. And he's going to go over one more lane. And he's going to go up and race past everybody else. So how do you know that? 30 seconds later, he does it. She's like, what in the world? Whatever. And of course, she rolls her eyes. And I'm, I'm peacocking next to her like, <laughs> I'm ICT, baby. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Of course, I'm going to know he's going to do that. So the same thing happens in the market. You have to anticipate the thoughts and expectations of individuals that are going to see price action and they're going to anticipate nothing in the future. They're going to react. They're going to chase, which is why my Judas swing is so effective at the right time. Time. So there's a time and place for everything, but you, you are not to try to react to price. Even in your entries, you're not reacting. You're anticipating. When you're moving your stop loss, you're not reacting. You're anticipating. When you're taking your partials, you're not reacting. You're anticipating it going to a specific level so that way you can press the exit or have your limit orders there to scale off your potential partial profits that always pay 100%. They never, ever fail. So when we look at price or when we're looking for setups, or we're trading a particular model, time is a very important factor. There has to be a reason for that trade to even materialize. And you don't want to go in there in the first few minutes of trading and say, okay, this is it. I'm going in because now the markets have opened. Everybody else is dogpiling and everybody else is you know, creating this congestion like rush hour. And I'm afraid I'm going to be left behind. So I have to do what? I have to react to what, what I see in the price action. So therefore, I have to do whatever else is doing, and that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. Now, compare and contrast that mindset, which is very stressful, mind you. I mean, think about it. How, how can you know with any assurity what, what you're doing is statistically pro probable of having continued success when you're just guessing you're guessing you're reacting to what you think you're seeing in price when price is always fluctuating up and down now put that to the side for a moment and then think about it like this let's talk about each individual session okay and some of the characteristics that each one of those trading sessions have and how you should go into those trading sessions with the proper mindset for anticipation not reacting because your job as a trader, unlike 99.999% of every other trader, teacher, trader that wants to share what they think is good advice, uh, your job is not to react to price. It is absolutely not. And if you believe the statistics that 90% of traders actually fail, why would you take advice from people that are all saying the same stuff? You got to be able to react to price. Your job is not to be able to predict the future. It is absolutely your job to predict the future. That's why most of them fail because they don't have 
the skill set, number one, to anticipate things that are generically in price action. And they're all time-based. You can set clocks to it. And that's the reason why I'm consistent. When I talk about things that should happen in the marketplace, the, the primary function behind the accuracy is I'm only really focusing on specific times. Because those times are algorithmic. And if there is an algorithm, and this is this for a moment, let's just put it aside for a minute whether there is or isn't. I, I know there is, okay? Most of you know there is, but let's make the case for a discussion for the idea that maybe there isn't an algorithm, okay? If there isn't one, how is it that a trader can go in and trust that a setup will form perform a specific function in price delivery that we can anticipate. It would be hard to do that. Like what rule-based ideas, apart from pattern trading, which I'm not a pattern trader. I don't look for price patterns. I look for inefficiencies and liquidity. That's it. That's all there is. And I look for that in time. Specific times of the day, there's very specific times of the day where you as a trader can say, I have to be able to control myself and not allow impulsiveness to come into the marketplace and draw me in to trades that would equate to overtrading, which is a problem even for traders that can be profitable. And maybe you have done this. You, you can go in, you can find a trade or two and get profits but then you want to do something else maybe because you see me tweet something maybe you see other traders out there other influencers and you see them doing something and you can't get the dopamine hit that you know that they're getting when they win if they're even winning you don't know if they're being honest with you so you seek that hit that feel good that rail like on cocaine okay you want to get a high you can't treat the markets like a drug. You can't treat it like, you know, a bump of adrenaline. This is a business. You need to mind your business. And when you make money, the job is to keep the money. But ICT, listen, man, you don't understand. I had a trade. I was up 1200 bucks, and I, I allowed the market to scare me out. I was looking at this guy on YouTube, and he said he was going to do this and do that. It scared me. I read one of your tweets, ICT, and it made me get out of the trade too early. And then I regretted it because it ended up making my profit target and even more. But I got out of it because you scared me with a tweet, or I saw something else that made me second guess myself. Okay, what's the root cause of that? It's not me. It's not the other person. It's not the other YouTuber or influencer. It's you. You didn't trust your model. So if you don't trust your model and you're not following a, a rule-based idea and you take a trade off that could have paid your full profit or more, you can't worry about or more because if your targets have limit orders on it, how can you get upset that it went past it and went more? Why should you be upset about that? Your business model was you were taking a trade to that point. Your business model says you had a stop loss at this point, risking that much money. You were anticipating in the beginning, but now you're reacting to the influences of maybe something I've tweeted, a student of mine has done, other influencer, other trader, other YouTuber. You're not trading your trade anymore, is it? It's you reacting. Reacting to trades, reacting to price, reacting to other people's success or failures is a recipe for failure. You have to keep that stuff at a very small level of influence. And it's better, really, to not have it at all. I promise when you guys get to the point where you know what you're doing and you leave social media, you turn it off. Your trading is going to go through the roof. Your performance is going to be astounding. You're not going to care how you measure up to somebody else. And you're not going to worry about what they're doing, how bad they hurt themselves, or how much money they made, or what their payout is, or where they're at on the FTMO leaderboard. All those things are there 
to cause you to do more of what is likely to incur failure. The statistics are there. 90% of people fail doing this. So if you entice them to do it more frequently with larger leverage than they should, you can trade with 15 contracts with your funded account challenge. Well, guess what? That is a recipe for them to get another reset fee from you. And my son went through that. Oh, it's only a hundred and some dollars or whatever it is. I'll, I'll get it. And I'm going to prove dad wrong. Okay. Well done. You paid them. You made nothing. So he has to go back to square one. What's square one? Waiting for specific times of the day. So let's look at the, the London session. Now, as far as indices, I haven't talked too much about indices, but we'll, we'll be doing that. And I actually got some live sessions we'll do during the London hours. What's that? I got a call out of work. I can't miss that, ICT. <laughs> there you go. Anticipation. You can't react to it. So London, by characteristic, um, what I'm referring to is in, we always refer to things in New York local time. So whatever the time is in New York, you need to have a clock set at your trading desk that is always showing you New York local time. I don't care where you live in the world. Everything algorithmically is running on New York time. I don't care who tells you otherwise. I, it, I don't care. Okay. This is the way it is. <laughs> Just submit to it. So when I talk about specific times of the day, it's always on the basis of New York. Okay. So uh, London time between two o'clock in the morning, New York local time to 5 a.m. New York local time. That's a three hour window. And the sweet spot is between two o'clock and four o'clock. So those two hours, but it can extend to 5 a.m. Generally, you're going to get some kind of false breakout. Okay. And that's not earth shattering. There's always been some idea of expectation of anticipating some false breakout in London. That's just the natural characteristic to it. What you need to be concerned about is where we are coming from on the hard time frame weekly and daily chart. If you're trading in London, if you're not referring to the weekly and daily for your setup, you're trading blind. You have to look at what that weekly, what's the importance of the weekly chart, Michael? Well, I talk about how you can anticipate, not react, anticipate where that weekly chart candle that's forming or that will form tomorrow when it starts on Sunday at 6 p.m. when all trading begins. Now we're starting a new weekly candle. So you want to anticipate the likelihood of that weekly candle expand, expanding up or expanding down. And you're looking for an inefficiency or stops that's most likely they're going to be the draw. It doesn't mean you're going to be right. Sometimes I get it wrong. It's okay. It, it, you're going to, especially with the climate right now, you know, we don't know what war is going to break out. We don't know if the bank's going to close over here. We don't know if, you know, the Fed's going to do that. There's so many things that are compounding the difficulty right now. And anybody that tells you it's easy, they're lying to you. They're just championing. They're getting lucky sessions at the time. And they're probably not showing you all the times that they're losing. But you have to factor in what that weekly chart is doing, likely to do. And that starts your bias, bullish or bearish. And on the daily chart, you have to confer with the previous day's range. Now, let's assume for a moment that the weekly chart, you think that there's going to be an expansion lower on whatever market you're trading. Now, this is both Forex and index futures and commodities. Okay, so it's not, when I, unless I say, here, here's another general rule of thumb. Unless you hear me say this only works, everything I'm teaching you works on Forex and it works on futures, index futures and commodities. Okay. I, I don't know about crypto. I, I don't have any affinity for it. So I'm uh, just going to let you discover it for yourself. If it works, great. If it doesn't, I don't care. I don't care either way because I'm not going to be trading any of that. So London, you're going to look at the previous day's range. And let's assume that you're looking for lower prices. You think that that weekly candle is going to expand. If yesterday's daily range is up, close, or down, close. 
there's more advantage if the candlestick from yesterday is up close because you you want to see a move that breaks below that yesterday's low. And once it does that, that lower quarter percent or lower third of that daily range, if you are in fact correct about your analysis and it's going to go lower based on the weekly chart, your sell setup is going to form in the lower quarter or lower third of the previous day's range. Now, by itself, that's not earth shattering, but I'm going to tell you something right now. If you chase price action and you always get burned, go back and look at your losing trades and you'll see that's exactly what you didn't see. So it has to refer back to a previous portion of the previous day's range. And this is not new. This is all in my core content. Um, I teach this in core content. But because there's so much content and you breeze through them too quick, like Netflix and chill, you're binge watching. And it's so much information. You have to watch these videos multiple times because you're going to you're not going to have an appreciation for what I'm talking about because you haven't encountered it yet in price. And then when you start looking at it conceptually and looking for it in old moves, then it's impactful. Then it has much more meaning to you. And then you'll learn more about using it and how it will groom you into a better analyst. You can't be a good trader without becoming first a good analyst. And so many of you just want to be a rock star trader and not know how to read markets. And it never works. That never works. That's why you get these flash in the pan you know, winners, but you can't hold on to them. You're like a gunslinger that just picked up a gun for the first time. And you got lucky. You got lucky, and now when it comes time to do a duel with someone who has lived their life as a gunslinger, you get gunned down. And if you have the breath in you long enough to think about what you did, you'd be admitting, oh, I wasn't ready for this. <laughs> so in London, you're looking for false breakouts. Okay. And you want to see, now this is where you write stuff down, folks. You want to see some measure of a 15 minute or five minute relative equal highs inside of the range that would be in the lower third or one quarter of the previous day's range when you're bearish. Now, some of you are like, uh, why don't you just do this on a video? Can you just show me? Can you just listen? Because I'm explaining it to you. This is how you learn how to do it. You go into your charts looking for it. And when you find it and you do examples of logging that, and having dozens of them as examples, then it's more meaningful because you found them using these rules. Whereas if I just show you a chart, oh, okay, well, it doesn't mean anything to you. You didn't do any work to look for it. But when you see it and you study how it reacted in price after that, okay, we're anticipating that future reaction by price. We aren't reacting to price. We're anticipating price to do these specific things, which is what? If we're bearish in London, you want to look for a single high or a relatively equal, like equal highs inside of the previous day's lower one third or one quarter part of the daily range of yesterday. Whatever the yesterday is, if it's a Monday, it's Friday's daily range. Otherwise, it's whatever the previous trading day is. That's pretty simple rules, right, folks? So in between two o'clock and four o'clock, we would anticipate a rally above those relative equal highs on a five or 15 minute chart, whichever one's easier for you to see. With Regardless, you'll see it. If you want to use a 15 minute chart as a bellwether, that I use that as mine, but you can look at it on a five minute basis. And as it rallies above that, what's going to be resting above those relative equal highs or single high buy stops. And the characteristic for the London session is to run up and entice traders to chase it going long. When in fact, it's a function of running into buy side liquidity for smart money to absorb those buy stops and be counterparty as they flood the market with buy orders. Shorts are entered by smart money there because it's a run on liquidity. It's engineered to provide a entry mechanism for smart money to go short. It takes a lot of confidence to take that type of trade because usually in London, the Judas swings are very violent and they're quick. 
and it feels like it's going to go up a hundred pips. It's going to go up, you know, uh, 80 handles on the S and P look at this thing move, man. Wow. It's going up 12 handles. Look how fast it's moved. This thing's going to keep on going. If you feel that way, you're reacting to price. When we're looking for that to be a run real quick to get to those stops so that stops can't be pulled. And once that happens and the orders are not pulled by the traders that have those orders resting there, we anticipate price rejecting there and going lower. Now, if you can't take that type of trade or entry in the beginning, you, you, you won't. Let's just be fair. I say this all the time. Buying sell stops and selling short buy stops is one of the hardest things to do as a trader because at the time when it happens, it's fast, it's furious, and it's scary. And you have to know what you're looking for, which is why you have to anticipate and predict the future. You have to. Profitable trading is predicting the future, folks. I don't know why you want to argue with that, but that's what it is. Reacting to price. Okay, you reacted to what it did and you entered into a trade. Now what? You just let whatever the, the, the wind carry you in the, in the current Without a rudder, you just, whatever happens, happens, man. And, you know, stuff's real random. If that's how trading really is, the hell with that. I'm never going to do it. I would never do that. Anybody in their right mind that would go into a venture like that, risking money, saying, well, you know, you just got to see what happens. <laughs> you know what that did for you when you started your demo trades, right? You get out there, let me just push the button on board. Let me see if I can make $5,000 in 10 minutes. And you lose. So you know that mentality, what it does for you. And it's not going to change with real money. Let me see what happens if I push the trade on. Boop, there it is. I got funded. I got through the, the portion of where we pass it. Now let me see if I can just make one of those real quick five-figure withdrawals. Because you know, if I get one of them, that'll be enough to carry me through even knowing that I don't know how to trade. And you wrestle with all that stuff because you're trying to do stuff that you're not prepared to do. You don't know how to anticipate. You're reacting, but you caught anticipation. You may share it with the community and me that you found a trade, but you're probably not being honest about what you felt the entire time you did it. It was just that one that panned out for you. So I'm not trying to encourage that type of thing in our community or in any of my students. You need to be 100% honest. And if you're struggling, find out what you're struggling on. But having a time-based approach helps you identify where your problem areas are. If you're not trying to trade at a very specific time of the day, how are you going to be able to measure your progress? How could I fix your issues for you if I was to sit down with you? I'm not, I'm not making this invitation for you folks. I'm just saying, if you were granted the opportunity to sit down with me one-on-one, -on -one, side by side, right next to each other and say, okay, I said, here's some, here's my problem here. I'm doing this. I took a trade in London and you know, this, that, and other thing. And then, then I saw this trade in New York and, and I was doing this and doing that. And then, you know, I made some money there and I was like, you know, I want to I go into the afternoon session. I'm going to trade the last hour in S and P. And then I lost everything. You know, what am I doing wrong? You know, number one, you're over trading Two, You're not being a specialist. You have to be a specialist in terms of what market you're going to trade. And what time of day are you going to trade? See, in your mind, you're thinking, wow, I can trade the London session. I can trade the New York open session. I can trade the lunch hour when they run on stops. And then I can do the PM session. And I got the two silver bullets in the AM session, the PM session. Good grief. I can do this. And all of a sudden, you're on the lot, you're top of the leaderboard of FTMO. And you're winning the Robins Cup. And you're blowing everybody else away on, on social media. And I get it. I know. That's what everybody wants to do. But you can't do that. You're learning all of this at your own pace. And some of you, if not all of you, are not providing the permission that you yourself require of yourself to take whatever time is necessary for you to learn how to do this. Books, authors, teachers, mentors, courses, products, none of that is going to remove the impact that you yourself bring to this. The learning curve is going to be whatever it is for you, however long it is, because of who you are and what you wrestle with. And pretending that you don't have any of these problems that I talk about and other traders may refer to is nonsense because there is no perfect student of the market that came in with no baggage or no mental barriers. Everybody has their own things. 
And some of them may not be a point of which where you overcome them. And it might not be feasible for you to do this. And then you would have to submit yourself to someone that does it really well and you buy their signals or setups or their product. And in that case, I don't think that's wrong. I don't think, you know, if someone can prove that they have something that works or they have a signal service that does well and you can't do it yourself, I don't think there's any shame in that at all. There's no shame in that because it's difficult, folks. You're, you're the deciding factor in whether you're going to succeed or not. It's not the thing that you're using. It's you. It's you and what you are willing to do and what you're not willing to do. So in London, you're looking for false breakouts and runs above relative equal highs when you're bearish or a single high that is inside of the previous day's range. Now, I know there's no chart here, but I want you to think about conceptually. Let's look at it like this. If you have note-taking instruments in front of you, this should be an easy thing for you to do. Let's just say, hypothetically, you draw a, a rectangle, leaving room for a rectangle to the right of it, okay? So you're going to draw a rectangle, and at the top of that rectangle, you're going to say 100 is the high, and the low is 20. So you have a previous range of 80 units. It could be pips, it could be points, it could be whatever. But we're going to say it's 80 units. Then you're going to see where you open up at 2 o'clock in the morning, New York local time. Wait a minute. What do you mean open up, ICT? Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Look, you just said, and I understand that the market starts trading at 6 o'clock. What are you talking about opening at 2 o'clock? Yeah, that, now we have a new opening range. 2 o'clock's opening price. What is that? The first opening price on the first one-minute candlestick at 2 o'clock, New York local time. You want to note that. Now that's an important, that's an important price point. From that price point, you want to see it be, if you're bearish, you want to see it be below the 20 level of the previous day's range because that's what that rectangle would represent. And that's for example, let's just say at 2 o'clock on the trading day that you're in right now, say it's 18 in reference to the previous day's range. So now you're below the low of yesterday's daily range. So from 6 o'clock all the way now to 2 o'clock in the morning, the market has done whatever it's done. If those highs, that relatively equal high or a single high in the previous range between 20 and 80, if there's a single high or relative equal highs in that lower one-third or quarter point of that uh, previous rectangle that you're drawing out that represents the previous day's trading, you're anticipating at 2 o'clock in the morning on the trading day that you're watching price it right now, you want to see a Judas swing shoot up. You're going to anticipate that. You're not going to react to it. You're waiting for it. You want to see that very thing happen. Now, as an ultra short-term scalper, you can buy that, but you have to be very nimble because it can go up there and turn on a dime quickly because London is a false breakout characteristic time period. When it runs up there, why are we anticipating a run back into the previous day's range, but only the lower quarter or one-third percent of the, the range? Because we don't think that the previous day's high is going to be taken out. And we don't think that half of the previous day's range is going to be a factor at all. The best shorts are going to occur in the lower half of the previous day's range when bearish. <gasps> what did you just say? The best shorts will occur in the lower 50% of the previous day's range. Where do they form? Above old highs, inside of that range. Where you look for it, just like the algorithm will look for it, it's going to look into 15-minute high or highs or 5-minute high or highs inside that range. So if you're in a 5- or 15-minute chart, it can't hide from you. <laughs> it's, it's right there. And we're going to anticipate, you're going to anticipate the market running up there. And when it does, you paper trade it. You tape read it. You do not live trade it. You have to condition yourself to do this. And it takes weeks and months to do it. Not, oh, a couple of weeks I've been doing it. I don't know what I'm doing. No, you don't. No, you don't. You do not. It takes time to desensitize yourself to the fear that London can create because it's very, very volatile. 
It can run up there and rip right lower. And really, if you know what you're doing, you can miss it or second guess it and totally do harm to yourself. So in London, you're looking for turtle soup scenarios, okay? And continuation on the basis of the higher time frame order flow. High a day, low a day is what's formed in the London session. Most of the time, not all the time, most of the time. In New York session, this is going to be for Forex traders, the New York Open Kill Zone, which is 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, New York local time. If you are an index trader, you can use that same time window as well. You use that time window uh, before the opening at 9.30, like between, like say, 7 o'clock in the morning, New York local time, to 8.30. You can trade that time window when there is a really big high-impact news driver for that day. For instance, like FOMC. Okay, Say FOMC or let's say... Um, well, no, we'll just stick to that. FOMC is probably the, the, the best case ex, uh, explanation for why you would want to trade before the 8.30 hour. Because generally what will happen is you'll get these really nice little price runs. that are. And I've, I've executed and showed you this throughout the year. And last year I was doing it too. And usually it's the time or examples where you see people saying, but didn't you say we have to wait for this and we have to wait for 10 o'clock? Folks, I'm giving you different models. That way you are allowing yourself to pick up on what you want to do. I can trade all of them, but I can't make you be able to trade all of them. I mean, over time you can if you put the time into it, but you have to find your own special time of the day in the asset class that you trade. And that's what I'm covering here. I'm helping you refine your level of focus. So you can pinpoint what your model is going to operate in terms of time. So that way you're not doing more than that's required. You're not diluting your attention. And you're also controlling fear of missing out. Because if you're operating in a business model or trading model that allows you to only operate in this two or three window time period of every individual day, you turn the charts off and you walk away and you exercise discipline. Over time, you won't care what the market has done over here or this time of day or who made this, who made that. You're trying to get better at this. You can't improve by worrying about how much other people, me or anyone else, is making or losing or how often we get it right or wrong. You can't do anything to make yourself better by doing that. So why are you worrying about it? If you're pocket watching me or anyone else, or if you're entertaining other people that do that, you are wasting your time. You're wasting time to groom yourself into the analyst that's necessary for that profitable trader to work with. Because the trader's not going to be doing anything except for what the analyst says is good to go. And you can't do all these trading sessions in the beginning. You can't. Now, you can study and backtest all of them. That's not trading. That's a good use of your time. But you can't go in as a new trader trying to do all these things simply because you've heard about it or I've talked about it. So therefore you're going to go in there and you're going to figure it out. You know, you don't figure it out that way. You study, you back test and you figure out where it fits for your life. That's the only figuring out you're doing. Does your life allow for you to trade in the London hours? Most people can't. If you can find time to get in there and trade in the pre-market hours before 9.30. And look for a setup between 7 o'clock and 8.30. Okay. There you go. You, you, know, you, can, you can find a setup that will probably yield you an opportunity. And then you're done. Where everybody else is waiting for the 9.30 opening at Equities, opening bell in New York, to find their trade. Or if they trade the silver bullet model, they have to wait till 10 o'clock. And this is funny when I see people, I'm taking trades and I'm doing something before 10 o'clock. They're like, wait a minute, didn't you say we have to wait? Who did I say had to wait? You. I didn't say we. I said you wait until 10 o'clock. I'm not saying we wait till 10 o'clock. I said you. I'm tweeting you wait till 10 o'clock. That's not me saying I'm not going to do anything else or anything in addition to because I have a varying spectrum of experience in terms of students. 
Like I have long-term students that have been here. I have charter members that are in my mentorship. I have students that have been with me longer before I did mentorship and never joined my mentorship. And their level of experience with me is much more vast than yours. And then I have the neophyte that just come to me today in this discussion today. First time they never heard me before and they're listening to it. It probably doesn't make much sense to them. But their experience with me is brand new. So when I counsel you, to do specific things or not to do certain things. That doesn't mean I'm limited to that, but to keep the growth of the entire community going, not just being a one trick pony, which you can clearly see, I have a whole lot of ponies in my fold. <laughs> I got all kinds of models, okay? And my models work because of the element I'm teaching here, time. I'm looking for setups in the New York session. The characteristic for New York is a continuation. Of what? Whatever London did. When does that not occur? If the range expansion that occurred in London and then continues into New York and it trades to a higher time frame PD array, something that I would have been targeting anyway, which was the basis for the draw on the bias for the weekly chart and or daily chart. So in other words, if it gets to my higher time frame target, then what shifts in my analysis? Market reversal profile. Otherwise, I'm looking for New York session to continue in the direction of whatever that higher time frame draw is on the weekly and or daily chart. And I'm going to submit to that. And I'm going to look for the things that I teach you that the algorithm will show in price delivery, inefficiencies, runs on stops, the whole business. I'm looking for those factors to come in agreement with that. And if it doesn't materialize, or if it's wishy-washy, it could be done and explained both directions. That's low probability. It's not a trading environment I'm going to trade in. And then I watch, or I'll tell you, let's, you know, this is what we're looking at. We're watching it. So it gives you experience to see what it's like when it's not optimal, but still putting chart time in. You need to have that. And I have the other students that are coming here because their attention span is the size of a gnat. And they want everything right now. It's already three weeks late. You just met me and you want to get right to the point of a hey, take a trade or you don't know what you're talking about or you don't know what you're talking about because you're doing this and you're doing that and you're not entertaining me. This is not how I want to be taught. Then go somewhere else. I promise you there's a lot of people out there that's going to teach you wonderful things to get into the marketplace. But the results are not going to be what you would get in comparison here. You're not going to be in control of yourself. You're going to be constantly looking for a new high, not in equity but in dopamine and that's what social media traders and influencers pre present to you and provide you. I am not trying to do that. Now when the market performs a specific way, then obviously I'll put a meme out there, a little funny little, you know, tweet of some kind to, to anchor it emotionally to you, not to make it look like we're celebrating, you know, ego or anything like that. It's to make you feel like this was worth you watching it. And if it causes you to smile or laugh or you know, think to yourself, like, oh, no, I see these a ham, it anchored it. And that's all I'm aiming for because it's meaningful because you didn't take a trade. So I have to give you that cookie, that, that yellow belt, from a white belt to a yellow belt. That's that little progression for you as a student because you didn't take anything out of it money-wise. You didn't lose any money. You didn't make any money. But I have to anchor it to something that you can recall or inspire you to journal it. Because until it makes its way into your journal, it's wasted time and attention. And I'm going to say that again. If you're watching or listening or look at my tweets and you do not journal the things I'm calling your attention to, you are absolutely wasting your time. You're not wasting my time. I know this stuff. But you're wasting your time. And that, that growth, that learning curve is being elongated and pushed further into the future by you not doing the simple thing of simply logging the experience. What does that mean, logging it? Framing it in your chart by time. When did that, when did that set up form? In the times I'm talking about here. And we have a couple more I'm going to get to. But you look at it in the basis of time. And how does that move fit in the grand scheme of the last three trading days? Where we are in terms of what the weekly candle was likely to do. Expand up, expand down. Where did it occur in the calendar event? For that particular trading week, did it occur on the heels of a medium or high impact news driver? In other words, you look at the economic calendar, if a medium impact or a high impact news event 
a report or something like that. Was it on the heels? Does it occur after that market report hits the wires and people can see the data? Or was it in between a medium or high impact news day? All those factors mean something. And you have to find your own comfort and how you're going to trade. I, I, I don't say traders need to be afraid of medium or high impact news days. We want those days because there's going to be a lot of manipulation. And then if they're going to manipulate the market, that means they're going to punish one side of the marketplace. And we can see clearly what side's going to be punished. You know, I, I do this every single week. Every time I sit down with you, I outline what I think is going to happen. And for the most part, it pans out. Not always, but most of the time it does. And it's all based on time-based principles. It's scheduled volume inflows. That these things occur because this is where all the orders are going to come in. Or they're going to run for the pending orders that are existent in price action. And how you're going to engage that. And it may feel like a, a whirlwind of ideas that you're being confused by because I'm always introducing something or I'm, I, I'm executing on a, a model or approach that maybe I haven't taught you yet. But I don't like sitting down anymore because I've been here doing it long enough that people know that I can do this. And students know that I can do this. Even the people that don't like me know I can do it. But they just want me to jump and dance around for them. Okay. And that's entertainment for them. I want to be able to show you examples and then teach you the logic that was utilized in it. Not like I've done in the past where I've taught many things theoretically. Say, like, okay, here's conceptually, this is what you do. Da, da, da. And then people go out there and they can't do it themselves. So they assume, oh, it doesn't work. Wrong. You can't make it work. I wouldn't waste my time putting it into rules and presentations if it wasn't logical and if I couldn't do it. So I've switched my mo to now doing the thing showing it and then going in and teaching it conceptually and then i, I disarm them because i've done it this is what i've done and then i go back in and i can show you this is what i utilized and then you can take that logic and go into back testing and see it exists not just in that example but it exists in many other examples and it might become your model but you decide that i don't decide that i want to be the guy that make it easy for all of you here's the one hit wonder this is it. This is all you have to do. Do this, this, this. And you'll be able to make money all the time and not lose any money. And that would be great. And I wouldn't monetize it. I would give it away for free. I promise. I swear to God almighty. If I had one thing that simply worked one way, only had to do this one thing, it would be given to you for free by me. But practically that doesn't exist. Realistically, it can't be obtained. Because all of us have our own individual quirky characteristics, their own personality, and you have character flaws. All of us do. And you have to limit your exposure to these markets because they're Rorschachs, they're ink blots. You're going to see what you want them to show you. You're going to read into these candlesticks whatever you want to see happen. Now, if you're anticipating things with a logical rule-based idea based on statistical probabilities and things that have occurred in the past, and that's your reason for doing it, then okay, fine. Uh, then I agree with you looking at that ink blot that these characters line up in forms of uh, you know candlesticks. We see a, a narrative in there versus, well, if it does this, then I'll do that. That's reacting. We're, uh, we're not reacting to price. We're anticipating it. So in New York session, whether you're a Forex trader trading between 7 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning New York local time, or if you're an index trader trading anywhere between you know, as early as 7 o'clock in the morning all the way up to 11 o'clock, you don't want to take any new setups after 11. Unless, now here's the caveat now, unless your model is to trade in the lunch hour, which takes much more experience. In the beginning, I don't want you to try to do that because you probably don't know very well where liquidity would be resting, how it would work against the range that's already formed for that particular day. You wouldn't know what liquidity pool to aim for, what specific low. And if you think about it, when I do trades, well, look at what happened on Thursday. You know, I did it real time. I said, okay, I'm taking three of the remaining six contracts off because now we're 50-50. Would you have known enough to do that? Chances are probably not. 
But I left three contracts on in the event that I, as the analyst, I, as the trader listening to the analyst in me, was incorrect. So if it was to go lower, I still had three on, but I didn't have the six on that I had on. I had nine contracts short, took partials, a below an old low on a limit, then three off because it didn't continue. And left three on with a stop that would, if it got stopped out, it was in the black. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a losing trade. It would be a missed opportunity on the final balance. Lunch trading is like that. It takes experience. And sometimes I'll get that lunch hour wrong, which is why I don't do a lot of it. But when it's really obvious, when it's really, really obvious, I share it with you. And you see people say, you taught us not to teach. You're teaching us not to trade in the lunch hour. And here you're trading the lunch hour. I'm the teacher. I'm teaching you when I can do it, when I'm comfortable doing it. It might be a model for some of you. And you disregard everything else out there. And that sounds crazy, but I'm making an allowance for who you are as a person. You don't know what you don't know yet. You don't know what impact certain things are going to be for you as a student. You don't know what it's going to be like when you find your model. It's going to be something completely diametrically opposed to what you thought trading was all about. You find your profitable model and you're consistently finding setups and you're going to look back and say, I, I didn't know anything. Look what I'm able to do. And this is what I'm doing. This is all I have to do. If I just live and bloom right where I'm planted, I'll do whatever I need to do monetized. Five handles consistently. Every setup that you look for, if you just find five handles that nets you that minimum, you don't need to do any more than that. You literally can carve out independent wealth. And that is defined by however you want to define it. Whatever dollar amount, given enough time, compound interest will allow you to get there. But you can't do that. If you're jumping around trading in a New York session, London session, afternoon session, PM session, you're just trying to get in here and do everything. No, 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 no. Backtest all those sessions. Yes. Actively trade and anticipate your setup in every single one of them. No. The only thing you're doing is compounding the likelihood of failure, losing trades, and drawdown. And you're new. What are you going to do when you have drawdown? You're going to want to fix it real quick. Because a Band-Aid ain't going to work for you. What's a Band-Aid? Take the boo-boo, limit it, cover your, your, your loss, cover your little cut, your paper cut, cover it up and walk away and let time do the healing. That means don't take any more trades. That's hard to do, isn't it? But you don't understand. I got to go, go look at myself in the mirror, ICT. I did something I knew I shouldn't have done. I got to fix it. You're not in the right state of mind to fix it. And you're going to look at these next sessions, like I'm covering here in the same trading day, and think. That you're going to have the skill set while you're in drawdown, mentally. Not that not, we're not talking about the mental, uh, not the mental, but the financial aspects of what drawdown you may have incurred. You're in mental drawdown. You're now a dangerous, wild animal, and you're going to turn yourself loose to your money, to your account. A caged animal, a cornered animal, poked and prodded. Now made aggressive. That's what you are. You're aggressively trying to take back what somebody or something or the market took from you when you did it to yourself. The band-aid approach is the right way. Limit it. Stop the bleeding. Come back when you're ready to do it again, but not the same session. That's how a brand new trader should do it. Not, I got to fix it right now. No, you don't. Who said you had to? You, the wounded animal saying that. You're home. You're safe. You're in a position where you can't lose any more money. You are out of the market. You've been stopped out or squeezed out. You're done. The damage is done. Stop the bleeding. Put a Band-Aid on it and come back when it heals. Put, put one sleep between your drawdown and your next trade. Use that as a rule-based idea. Let yourself go to bed and sleep a whole night before you take another trade. It's hard, but you desensitize yourself. I'm sorry. I, I, I go on these these rabbit trails and it's completely outside the scope of the notes here, but I feel like I'm talking to somebody. I don't know who it is, but uh, if that resonates with you, you know, give me a you know, notification on Twitter that you it, it found its home in you. But the New York session is a continuation of whatever London is. 
So if London was going down and it has not reached your higher time frame daily or weekly objective, we expect some measure of short-term retracement and then continuation in the New York session until the higher time frame weekly or daily objective that we would be reaching for as a draw on liquidity, the target. When that's hit in the New York session, then you are entering New York reversal profile, not market profile where they have the uh, the vertical volume bars you know, going horizontally across the, the chart. That, that to me, I don't use that stuff. When I say profile, that's a like a schematic or a roadmap or a, a visual representation of how the market should perform. If you were looking at it from like a line chart basis, how it should look after the fact, but we're anticipating it to perform or behave a specific way. So New York sessions continuation of, of London and then New York goes into market reversal profile where whatever happened in London in the early stages of New York now reverse and the market goes a different direction. Whether if it's going lower, now it will go higher or if it's going higher, it will now go lower. If and when it hits the weekly or daily objective that we were aiming for that framed our bias or premise behind our trading week. Silver bullet inside of the AM session. That time window is very, very specific. It's inside of 60 minutes. Now, that doesn't mean the entire trade is encapsulated inside that 60 minutes, but most of the time you're going to find it is. But you can find the entry in between 10 o'clock and 11, and all you're looking for is a continuation of what London and or New York is outlining. So we have a target. We're looking for a draw on liquidity. It could be a new week opening gap that we're aiming for. It could be a fair value gap above the marketplace that we're aiming for if we're bullish. And that draw on liquidity is what we're looking for a reach from that fair value gap that forms. Whatever the fair value gap, the first one that forms between 10 o'clock and 11, that one, you're going to see that right there, that's going to be a catalyst for a minimum five handle run. The problem is you're not patient. You're impatient. And you're you're not going to sit still long enough to wait for that fair value gap to form. You're not going to have your chart annotated where the draw on liquidity is going to be reached for. So you're you're having all these indicators on your chart because you're looking for things to qualify and quantify and confirm something that my concepts don't require an indicator to tell. You know, I'm anticipating before your indicator shows whatever the indicator is going to show, I'm already anticipating all that stuff before the candle's even formed yet that would constitute your indicator creating the setups that you're using them for. I already know when and how the market's going to shift before moving averages later on cross over. Like I'm way ahead of the curve. My students are way ahead of the curve. We're in the future. When we're trading our chart, we're trading the future. We're entering on a future move that we have a statistical probability that is going to likely form and go to a specific price level by a specific time. And everybody else is waiting for their indicators to talk to them. I'm sorry. I'm tone deaf to indicators. I don't have any interest in them. If you find value in that, that's fine. But I'm not teaching indicators. I'm teaching independence from everything else except for open, high, low, and close and time. The lunch hour, the New York lunch hour is technically 11 o'clock in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon, New York local time. So it's a two-hour window. And the reason why is uh, back in the days where we had open up cry and electronic trading hadn't really taken off yet. Uh, sometimes at the morning session had a really nice move. Uh, guys would go grab a bite to eat because they felt like they would have a very busy afternoon session. So they want to go early, beat the lunch rush. To whatever it is, the you know they would go and run and get their their lunch. Sometimes they would eat at their desk, and others would be just hopped up on goofballs and simply not leaving the floor and just trade through the lunch hour. But lunch hour trading is a real thing, and the algorithm operates on that mechanism of reversing back to whatever the session in the morning stops, wherever they're at, whether they're bull stops or or or. And apple side, buy stops or bear stops, uh, sell stops or buy stops, rather, buy side or sell side. And 
as a as an example, let's assume that we've watched the market go higher in London, and then we had a continuation in New York, and whatever the target is that we had for our weekly chart or our daily chart has yet to be reached, so we're still below it. Your expectation for the lunch hour between eleven o'clock and one is you want to go through and look for where a relative equal low or a fifteen minute low is because that's exactly where the algorithm is going to go. Don't take my word for what I just said. Don't just say, because ICT said it, I believe it. No, go back and look through your charts and you will see what I just said is algorithmically proven to you. It goes on every single week. It happens this way all the time. It does it all the time. It's flawless. It never fails. It's always in the charts. You can set your life around it as a model. This is one way that you can look outside of the AM session and the PM session and go right in there. Once you understand how liquidity works and what you're looking for, that could be your model, your setup. And I have done examples of that last year and this year, recording my entries. And you're buying those sell stops. As it runs underneath it, you're buying it. What makes it better? If it's a, if there's a fair value gap or a volume imbalance just underneath that low, that right there is a unicorn. Why is it going to go down there? Because it's going to pick up more orders to allow smart money. It's not selling pressure. It's not a lack of buyers that lets the market drop. That's all the BS that's told to you in books and other authors and people out there that say, I've been in the industry. I used to be a, a trader at the desk. I'm a market maker. No. You're a trader with a religion. You were a dealer. They called a market maker. I'm talking about the mechanism that is the market that was coded and brought to us as a price engine that causes the fluctuations in price. And then you chase it. Other, tra other traders, they chase it. They go in there, buy and sell after it. It will use that human psychology to know that there will be trades printed at the levels they want. When the algorithm's running, it's not going to go to some random level. It always goes to something that I've taught you as a PD array. It's always like that. But yet you dismiss it as it's buying and selling pressure. It's this. Elliot had a wave. It caught a wave. There was supply and demand, buying and selling pressure. It took it up there, down there, whatever. It was my harmonic uh, you know, platypus pattern. Something that, you know, it takes more faith to believe in that than simply there's an algorithm that controls how far price will go. You have a belief and understanding that there's a circuit breaker, right? The market goes down this much, they halt trading, and it has to be uh, you know, a number of time. Interesting, isn't it? Time has to transpire, and the market needs to uptick before they'll let lower prices start. Well, what in the hell do you think that is? That's control measures. You, do, you think that they're going to let us, John Q. Public, Jane Q. Public, we're going to be able to wreck the markets and crash them if we want to collectively? Reddit folks thought that they were going to do that last year, didn't they? <laughs> Woo! It didn't happen, did it? It did not happen. Sorry. Sorry. But I told you that was not going to work. But they used them. They let them think that they were pumping it up. They bought it, and then they started selling it, distributing it when they were doing what? We're going to kill these market makers, and we're going to kill these fund managers, and we're going to put them out of business. You know, <laughs> that didn't happen. And they were laughing at all of you on Reddit. And I told you before it was going to happen. In lunch hour, that 15-minute low, when it's been bullish and we haven't hit that weekly or daily objective, it's going to roll down there. It's going to go right below that low. And it's going to engage those sell stops. And the market's going to be flooded with willing sellers at a low price. Why? Pray tell would that be advantageous. Because smart money will be buying those sell stops to reaccumulate new longs, add to or start new positions, and wait for that higher time frame weekly or daily chart objective to be met. And then you'll watch the PM session roll through and reach higher to that target or get closer to it ever so slightly. That's that liquidity matrix. Understanding where you are in it. You have to know where the market's going to go.
That's the first rule of Fight Club here. You have to know where is it going. You have to know that. If you don't know that, everything else afterwards, you're lost. If you don't know where you are going, where the market's being led to, it's an obvious level. It's in your chart. And that's what I'm sharing my experience with. I'm pointing to those things. I'm hoping that you're aligning yourself with, okay, I'm going to submit this, this studying price delivery in the basis of it's going there. And filter out all the things that would be opposing that as an idea in terms of trades. Accepting the fact that there will be fluctuations that you didn't participate in. That's okay. That's discipline. That's you sticking with a rule-based idea and you're keeping your focus on what is the highest probable direction. The market goes up and down, folks. Up and down, up and down. But where it's going to ultimately, once it gets there, then you can look back and say, wow, yeah, I can see how it was obvious there. But I'm teaching you how to see the obvious real time. It's not easy for some of you. Others it is. But most of you are going to find that it's very hard to do that because you want it to be easy. And I want to be able to make it easy for you. There is no other way to make it easier. You have to go through it. You have to condition yourself. You have to look for it to repeat over and over again within specific times of the day. So between 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock in New York local time, you're looking for a run on stops. What stops? The stops that have not been hit and punishing those individuals that may have trailed their stop loss up below an old low or down below an old high. If you're bullish and it's been going up, a 15-minute low, underneath that, that sell stops. It's going to run down there, take those, and then you're going to see it trade higher. Even if it fails and just goes to a higher high and never continues after that, that's still tradable. But some of you would think that that's a failure. It didn't keep going up to my target on a higher time frame chart, ICT, so that's a failure. Wrong. Could you get five handles out of it? And did you take five handles? That's how you start. That's how you build yourself up. That's how you grow. And eventually you do that enough and you start seeing setups that you know you've been here before. Yeah, I can get my five, but let me take five off with half the position and leave a runner. And then you graduate to becoming a 10 handle trader. And you do the same thing for a little while. Let that build up. And then you start seeing, this looks like it's one of those setups that gives me a 25, 30 handle run. Let me take off half at 10 and then leave a runner on. And then you start growing into being a 25 or 30 handle trader. But you just can't make a decision cold turkey one day and say, you know what? I've done 12, maybe 15 paper trades. And I've done two of these five handle with my live account. So I think I'm ready for 50 handle runs. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work, folks. It, that does not work. There's so much that you have to grow into and allow yourself to feel what it feels like to watch your profits go up and down while you're in those trades. I mean, you're, you're talking about something that if you have multiple contracts on, you know, you're likely to see thousands of dollars go up and down in unrealized profit. And the first time you encounter that, the natural impulse is, is I've got to get out right now. I guess it's stressful. All this extra money I'm making that I've, I've never done before is stressful. I got to get the hell out of here. It doesn't sound possible, right? You should, you should be thinking, well, this is great. This is going to keep making money. The first time you get there, it's scary because you don't want it to go away. You're afraid it's going to go back to zero or turn into a losing trade, which unfortunately in the beginning tends to happen for people that rush to that point. They haven't desensitized themselves to winning because winning is something that you have to get used to. And it doesn't sound right, does it, hearing that? You have to get used to winning. I, I, I could get used to winning real easy. No. <laughs> when there's money associated, associated with it, it is a very scary thing because now all of a sudden it's, well, think about it like this. If you have a trade and you take a losing trade, then you lose and you take another trade and, you, and then you lose and you take a third trade. Now you're, now you're down maybe 5%. Now you have analysis paralysis. You, you second guess everything. And now you know that looks like something you would have traded, but I don't really want to take it. I'm scared. Let's just see if it works. Then it works and you're thinking, oh man, I should have took that trade. Why didn't I take that trade? Because you have not grown 
in learning how to do this properly and you traded too much, you lost too much because 5% is too much for a new trader. You pushed yourself too far. So you have to let time heal it. That means take a week off. Come on, ICT, man. I'm never going to get to being rich if you keep talking about taking time away from the markets, taking this, taking that. You're not going to be successful if you think like that. You're the problem. You're impatient, you're impulsive, and you're reckless. And that can't be fixed by me. It can't be fixed by any other educator. And no product is going to fix it. No resource. No black box. No mentorships. No, none of that stuff is going to fix that because you have a problem. And that has to be corrected by you. Over time, going back to square one. And a lot of people aren't willing to do that. And those same people will always and perpetually fail. In everything they do, no matter what approach they use to trading, they're going to fail because they will not accept the facts that they themselves are presenting the catalyst for their failure. They're prolonging their development because they want to do it their way, have it their way, mentorship, have it their way, success story. Everybody wants to be a trailblazer. I get it, folks. I get it. They want to take something and make it their own and let everybody say, wow, here's your flowers, man. You did this and you did that. How about this? making money. <laughs> Who cares where you learned it from? Okay. Who cares how long it took you? Because believe me, when you start making a hundred thousand dollars a month, you're not gonna you're not gonna give a single fuck what anybody thinks about how you got there, how long it took. You're not gonna care. Even your own your own time and pressure that you place on yourself will be completely in insignificant because once you arrive there, nobody can take it from you. Nobody can change your mind about what you've done, the decisions you made to get to that point. That's empowerment. All of you can get there, but all of you are the biggest roadblock. You're the barrier. You are. Time is going to be the same for every one of us, but you make it require more time because of the things and decisions and all the factors that you bring into it. Your toxic thinking, your doubts, you're trying to keep up with everybody else. You're trying to measure up to this one, trying to measure up to that one instead of just simply thinking the folks that are making it available to you and using the advice and the conceptual ideas the proper way, not trying to reinvent the wheel. There's so many people out there trying to add to, twist the things that I've taught. And that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You have no idea what they're rooted on. You don't know what the logic is behind it. Remember, I had to take what is really out there that you'll never get your hands on. I had to create a language around it. So that way you can see it in a chart when it looks like this. But there's many times that things that create a breaker, you won't see that idea in the chart, but the same thing's happening. What? Yep. Dark pools. Another Twitter space for another time. So silver bullets, you have a fair value gap set up that's very specific in that 60-minute chart or 60-minute time window. One hour at 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, you have the lunch hour that runs on stops. Whoever's been making money, that's what it's going to do. It's going to run down there. Even if it reverses in the lunch hour, that's still a trade also. If you can anticipate that drop down, say the market's been going up, London session, New York session. Now you're entering at 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock an hour. You can sell short a one-minute 2022 model and aim for that 15-minute low. What? Yes. Yes, Virginia. Yes, you can do that. That is a model in and of itself. What's wrong with it? Nothing. It might not fit your appetite. It might not feel like it's something for you. But honey, it pays. It pays the bills. It makes ends meet. And guess what? Car notes get paid with it. Rent gets paid with it. Mortgage payments get paid with it. Vacations get paid for it, with it. Wardrobes get paid with it. Retirement gets paid with it. So what's your excuse? What's holding you back? Something. Something's holding you back. And then you had the PM session. Afternoon. Between 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock, the same thing you would expect to happen in 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock a.m. session, Silver Bullet. Well, look what we have here. Another 60-minute time window. We have to look for our stops 
or inefficiency? Where's the market going? Where's it reaching for? You know, you had that old high that you were aiming for all morning. It didn't get there. We have relative equal highs now across the afternoon. What's it going to reach for? The weekly and daily objective hasn't been met above the marketplace yet. So we're still bullish. Wait for a short-term shift in market structure. One minute and five minutes. Wait for a fair bay gap to form between two o'clock and three o'clock. And then when it drops down into it, when you're bullish, buy it and aim for that intraday high. If it can give you five handles, take it there. Leave a, leave a runner on and see if you can get to that higher time frame weekly or daily chart. That's how you trade your afternoon silver bullet. Simple. Real simple. There's a whole lot more things you can add to it to supercharge it, though. But that's the easiest, simplest little approach to that model being there every single day. Even in choppy days, it's there. Oh, it's there. Every day. Then you have the last hour of trading. Three o'clock to four o'clock. I've taught you several macros that exist in that hour. And now we're talking about the extreme of the daily range for indices. You're not trying to trade Forex back then, at, this, at this time. At one o'clock in the afternoon, that, that's it. You're done for Forex. Don't touch it after that. I don't care how much you see it do this and do that. You don't trade it. In London close, between 10 o'clock and 12, I apologize. I skipped over that in all my fever pitch. <laughs> about everything that's really outside the scope of this Twitter space that I had in mind. That 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock is the extreme range end of the daily range for your Forex trading pairs. It can extend to 1 o'clock, but generally between 10 and 12 in your local time. You can finish your whole business there and be done. But as an index trader, you're entering the lunch hour. Now you roll out of, say you're a Forex trader. And you want to trade a London session and New York session for Forex. And now you know that Forex goes a little bit colder the rest of the day in the U.S. hours. Stop trading Forex. Roll over into indices. Trade the lunch hour. Where's the 15-minute stop? Where's the stops? Who's made money? Where are they leaving their stop? Because this is resting right in the marketplace. And the algorithm will gladly go down to it or go up to it. And there it is. There's a setup there. Then. Beat that last hour, that's making the high or low of the day for index futures. Not all the time, most of the time. Unless it, he, it, it reaches the daily or weekly objective intraday, and that will be the higher low of the day. If it has done that, then the afternoon last hour trading has to be traded from a scalper's mindset. Looking for a 15 minute high or 15 minute low or 15 minute inefficiency above or below the marketplace. And that's your target and be content with it. Does it offer you five handles? If it does, get it and be done. So I've walked you through a daily range, mentioned the characteristics. They're very generic. Do you think about price like that? If you haven't been thinking about price like that, then you should. Is in my mind, the inner musings of the ICT, when I'm watching the daily range form, I have all these thought processes in my mind, and I'm anticipating certain things based on the logic I've showed you and talked about here. I am not surprised. I am not taken back in a gasp when the market does something at any one of these times of the day. I'm expecting all this stuff. But anticipating it and entering the trade is two different things. In the beginning, you need to just sit still and watch and you desensitize yourself. You remove all the doubt, all the fear, all the trepidation about you being able to do this. Oh, it's rigged. It's fixed. It's fake. He only shows you the winning trades. He this and that nothing. You have all these excuses that you have to sort out. All that's put to bed when you start seeing it happen over and over and over again. When you start seeing it live, pan out to script. Whose script? Mine. Not Elliot's, not Sam Sidens, not Wyckoff, mine. This market is absolutely predictable. But there's times when the market's going to be a little fickle. This is simply going to give you the setups that you like to see. New York session, optimal trade entries. 
London session, turtle soups that shift into 2022 model or optimal trade entry. Breakers really do well in London. Reversal market profiles in New York session. Once the targets on the weekly and or daily chart is met and reached, chances are we have an intermediate term higher low, and then a breaker can be forming there as well. You see how you can anticipate all this stuff? But you have to see these things. You can probably hear my son going crazy. He's in a tournament on his computer up here playing a PC game. <laughs> it gets nuts. But uh, all of these individual times of the day, the silver bullets are always continuation. There's, they're, they're continuations of whatever is in motion at the time. If you can't determine what is in motion, don't take the silver bullet. How about that? How's the logic for that? It's simple, isn't it? When in doubt, stay out. So we've walked through how to go into the time of day. What, what time frame of the day, you know, of all these different sessions, when are you going to set up shop? What's it going to be for you? Are you going to be a London boy? Are you going to be a New York uh, shirt that trades? Are you going to be a lunch hour hero? Or are you going to be a silver bullet shooter? A gunslinger in the morning or a gunslinger in the afternoon? Or are you going to be a giant come lately and trade the last hour trading? There is no advantage over any of them. They're all equally potentially profitable and they all have their advantages within and of themselves. Because they're time-based and specific in character. Each one has their own individual character. So you have to trust that this is enough. If you just do one of these sessions and make it your model, you will control fear of missing out. You won't have it. Because you're limiting your attention, your focus to one specific time of the day. And it meets and allows you to work within your life. See, so you're trying to probably do something that your business, that your school schedule, or your family, your spouse, your children, something's preventing you to be in the New York session. You want to do what I'm doing. You want to be able to do what the community's doing, but you can't do it. And you're frustrated. Like, man, what the hell? I wish this guy would talk about something else besides this time of day. I have just did today. Where are you in that? Because it checks somebody's box off everywhere. Every one of these time periods can be traded. I don't care where you live. I don't care where you live, what you're doing. You're going to have to make a sacrifice. You're going to have to, folks. If you want this bad enough, you're going to sacrifice. And here's the thing. If you don't back test it and see that there is absolute validity to what I'm teaching and showing you, forget the people that are making money with it. Forget all that. Okay. These companies could be fake. They could be paid on. They could probably paid actors by ICT. They're probably talking about money that doesn't even exist. This, this is make that argument. It's not true, but let's just say that for instance, okay? You looking at the old data, back testing and seeing it and then thinking, okay, I understand the concept and I'm going to go forward and now watch it going forward within one of these time windows of the day. Is it a lot of time that you're investing for that particular trading day? No. No, it's not. That's an advantage. You're not sitting there like a zombie staring into the abyss of these candlesticks and just not knowing anything, which is very frustrating and it's draining. These markets are vampires. If you hook up an IV tube to you and let it take all your blood, it will. It will suck you dry all the way to the marrow. So limit the exposure to it. If you can't find your setup in these times of the day, or if you lose, stop. You know it's never going to happen? You're never going to blow your account. You're never going to have major drawdown if you control your risk and keep it realistic and use real stops. You won't be fear of missing anything. You'll have a complete business model. And you won't have to work a part-time job schedule with it. It's very small. In terms of your time and attention is required. But you have to put a lot of time in the beginning when you're back testing and looking at old moves, studying it. Do these things exist? Or is he talking out his ass again? I'm telling you, go back and look at the charts. You're going to see it. And it repeats all the time. 
But see, what happens is, is you get caught up in all the new things I'm teaching, all the new content, all the new concepts. Give me a new trick, ICT. Teach me another magic trick. How about just using what I already taught right now? I've made it very simple. I've talked about very specific times of the day that is rule based because the algorithm is going to operate in these hours a very specific manner and it's going to deliver a price. Buying and selling pressure is not going to be a factor. The algorithm will price in all of these setups. That's why it sounds like arrogance. That's why people say, I don't like his attitude. He's too arrogant. He's too cocky. That's because I know my shit. I know the market. Like the back of my hand, I know it. I know I'm not going to be surprised Monday. I'm not going to be surprised on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It doesn't mean I'm taking a trade. It just means I know what I'm looking for. And if it meets what I'm expecting, and it all lines up and I feel like it's something I want to do, done. You'll hear about it. And I'll ask you, do you want to see a dose? And you'll watch me go in there. Like I've already seen it before. I have, but nonetheless, you'll get that same skill set, but you're pushing it further in the future by trying to always change, always transition into something else. That 2022 model that I gave on YouTube last year, man, that thing is a strong model. And for the folks to say, can you just get off these one minute charts, ICT? Get off these intraday charts. I need something on a higher time frame. I want to be able to swing trade. Okay, go to a four hour chart. The same thing that you use, or I've been using on a one to five minute chart with that 2022 model, if you put it on a four hour chart, that will allow you to swing trade. You got to wait for it. It takes a long time and it takes forever for the setups to pan out to your objectives. But guess what? Working class hero, that's your model. Did you have to change anything? Just the time frame. But all the logic is still there. You're not going to get a lot of trades. That's the sacrifice that you're going to have to make as a, a higher time frame swing trader. You're not getting a swing trade as many times as you can get a day trade or a scalp. I can find dozens of trades intraday. My students can find dozens of trades intraday. But we can't force dozens of swing trades. They don't form that frequent. It can't because the higher time frames are what they are. So if you like frequency and to be able to have velocity in your money, you short-term trade intraday. You have no overnight risk, no gap risk. What's gap risk? The difference between where we close on at 5 p.m. and where we open at 6 p.m. Where we close on Friday and where we open on Sunday. That's gap risk. In years before, you know, I, I I didn't mind holding over the weekend. I didn't mind holding overnight. I don't do that anymore. I will never do that in the future. I don't trust what can happen. It can do some crazy nonsensical thing and all kinds of manual intervention comes in because of something happening in, in the world where, you know, one country doesn't like what another country is doing. And an event that may or may not be foreseeable occurs and it, you're wiped out. A black swan event that we're in, we're in those conditions still. And it's getting more and more likely. All these factors make trading much harder. And I know there's competitors out there that like to sell their crap. And they like to use me as a as a sounding board to be able to say, okay, for, for the people that don't like ICT, <laughs> come over to my house. You know, I got this and I got that. And I can do this and I got cookies. Go over there. I'm not saying don't do that. Go over there. Whoever's trying to get your attention, you know, if you're not happy here, if you're not finding what it is you're looking for here, go do something else. Really do it. You might find something that works for you. I'm not opposed to that. I'm just saying my stuff is superior to everybody else's. And it might still not be effective for you because you have whatever going on in your head. And if they have something that is useful, that it makes a connection with you as a trader and it helps you find profitability. Great. Don't let me be an impediment to that. I'm, I'm never an impediment. But if you find profitability, don't come back and try to throw rocks at me and say, you asshole, <laughs> you didn't teach me this stuff over here. So, you know, I, I hate you, whatever. I'm happy that you're making money. That's what this is all about, man. This is it. 
I want all of you, even the folks that hate me, even the folks that can't find success in marketing their own stuff. I want all of you to do well because I know what's coming. I've known it. I knew they've been following me for a long time. Have known that I've been saying this was going to come. Even when we were in good times, I told you it was coming. And it feels like, oh, maybe it's getting better. It ain't getting better. They're just changing the way it looks. Because they have a lot more progress to make over the next 18 months. Central bank digital currencies are coming. Your money is about to change and turn into something that you don't recognize. And it will have an on and off switch. You don't perform or behave the way they want you to do. You can't spend your money the way you want to spend it. And they're going to get control of everybody like that. Because you can say, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to resist until they turn your food purchasing power off and you have children that are starving. And suddenly everything else that you've said in the past is going to mean nothing because you're going to make sure your, your family's fed. Like I said, I don't have all the answers, but I'm doing whatever I can to have a clear conscience that if it's feasible for us, there's nothing guaranteeing that trading is going to be accessible like it is right now. I mean, they, these funded accounts, regulation can come in, change all that. Or it could be permitting it. And then allow that type of thing and be regulated. Or we could have something happen where it disrupts the markets for a while. Imagine just for a second and you know, in closing, I want you to think about something here. If someone were to told you that the whole world was going to come to a screeching halt over something that was invisible. Had the ability to kill you if you stood up in a restaurant, but it was okay for you to sit down in a restaurant. So it was only effective at certain heights while in a restaurant. That event, okay, that startled everybody into thinking the end of the world was, you know, right here upon us and we're all going to die from some plague. And every global industry came to a, a screeching halt. You couldn't travel. You can't go anywhere. You can't do this. Can't do that. If someone would have told you that was going to happen a year before, two years before, and that we wouldn't be allowed to see people at funerals that we loved, we couldn't visit them in the hospital. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't even go to work unless you had this remedy, they said. You all would have laughed and said, there's no way in the world. No way in the world this would ever happen. And yet it did. The damage that, that has done, we're just now coming to grips with it. And you're seeing banks failing. You're seeing financial institutions that we're going to, they're, they're going to go out of business. Big names are going to go out of business. All this stuff is designed. And it's not outside of the realm of potentially possible. That we could have some kind of major disruption to our financial industry in the form of investing 401k. I've always said that the 401k is a perfect little, it's like a big stop loss. It's a liquidity pool that they're going to raid. Think about it. And all these people out here that have contributed to their 401 life savings in their 401. That's a big pocket of money that's sitting out there collectively across a lot of people's you know, retirement accounts. It may not be individually a large amount of money. For some, it is, but not, not a lot of people have millions of dollars in their 401k. But what happens if they have like 100,000 or 150,000 and do that over millions of people, hundreds of millions of people to have their retirement account they've been investing in, the company they worked for invested in with them? We have a unpayable debt. We have a, we we can't pay that. <laughs> okay, if you knew how much it would take for every individual person in our country to pay that on that debt, it, it, it's it's shocking. And they're going to raise the debt ceiling again, and you keep calling it a debt ceiling, 
and it keeps getting moved up. It's not a debt ceiling. But they are absolutely going to bankrupt our country to the point where there is nothing. Money won't have the same value that it has right now. And I told you last year, okay, for the folks that have been coming to these Twitter spaces, I told you last year, watch Saudi Arabia. Watch all the other countries. You know we're in some deep shit if everybody starts turning away from the dollar. And here we are. Months later, in spring, like I told you, April or May, you'll start seeing it. There it is. It's happening. It's unfolding exactly as I told you it would. In 2016, before Trump was elected, and I had never voted ever in my life, and I was not, I was not a Trumper. I'm not someone that falls in line with this Hegelian dialect. It's, just, it's an illusion of choice. You think you have a choice. You don't. They're all players in this theater. The whole world's a stage. And money is a control mechanism. Where it used to be a tool. Now it's a control mechanism. We're going to be told what we can and can't do because our money will be the control catalyst. Think about it. If it's a central bank digital currency, you can't get mad at the establishment and say, man, F you. I'm going to the bank and kick my money out and sticking it in mason jars and putting it in my backyard. Because cash ain't going to be there. It's going to be a digit that they can turn on and turn off. So how are you going to fight against that? You can't. Which is the reason why they're doing it. We want to put everybody in a system where they can access resources that everybody else has. They're going to sugarcoat everything. Every excuse as to why everybody has to have this new digital ID. They're going to have all these new things that locks your money up and you can't ever take it away from them. When all your real money, they have it. The bank owns that money. Everything that I have in a bank isn't technically mine until I have it in my hands. And it's going to a cashless system. I told you all this stuff years and years ago. And we're seeing it. And it's not just in America. It's every country that's going to roll out a central bank digital currency. And yeah, and you South Africa said, well, we're resisting it. You're resisting it for a little while, but it's going to happen whether you like it or not. It's going to happen, folks. It's happening. They're going to be able to stop everybody from protesting because food and money will be controlled. And I don't know all the answers. I don't even know if you being successful as a trader will be enough for some of you. But it's the only thing I can do to feel like I'm doing something positive and not have a guilty conscience. And I'm not exempt. And anybody else out there that has money is not exempt from this. And I am very controversial in the things I talk about. And the more time I spend on social media, the more likely I'm going to say something that's more controversial. And they're going to be adopting a social credit score. Just like in China, that's what's coming here. In America, it's going to come to your neighborhood and your state and your country. It's going to be there, whether you're Republican or not. It's happening regardless. You can't stop it. It's going to happen. So I'm going to be removing myself. I'm trying to get through this year. I'm hoping that I do have the time to get through to November. But I need to, I need to take care of my own house. I need to take care of my own family, my own friends. My attention is going to be needed. When all this stuff gets really fever pitched, my family members are going to be stressed out. And if my attention is diverted to all of you doing things that it's not necessary for me to do these things, I don't need to do these things. I'm doing it because I want to have a clear conscience when everything's going on and it's knee deep and it's hard for me and all of you. Me having a lot of money in a bank doesn't exempt me from them controlling what we do and how I live my own personal life. If I'm on social media and I say the things I'm saying right now, while I'm not saying, you know, resist and do this and do that, because I don't think that you're going to, you're not going to stop it. That That's my point. You're, you're not going to stop it. And people that think that they can vote their way out of this stuff, you're not voting anything out of anything. 
Any person that ever gets in leadership now, they're all part of the World Economic Forum. They're all selected. It's been like that since Reagan. You just didn't know about it. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality of it all. And it may sound dismal. It may sound, you know, why even bother trading? Because I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And you would cheat yourself out of a, a lifestyle that, you know, could be great if ICT is wrong. And I hope I am. I hope I'm wrong. I have not been wrong. All throughout all this stuff, before COVID, all this stuff. On Twitter, before I left it in 2019, I said, we are walking into something wicked. Something really wicked is coming. And I saw what was going on over in China. And again, in October, I told you in 2019, I said, man, get ready. Something weird is coming. And it's going to be worse than 9-11 and, and September 11th when they you know, grounded all the airplanes globally. Everything changes then. The world hasn't been the same since since 2011. When I say in 2011, <laughs> 2001, 19, uh, 19, uh, September 11th, 2001. That day started all this. Everything changed that date. The world slowly started changing. In the world prior to 2001, when the World Trade Center buildings collapsed, that has never been the same. And we're never going back to that. We're not going back to the way it was in 2019. We're going into a world that is very closely identified with that book, uh, 1984, which is why I told everybody years ago, read it. And you'll start recognizing where we are, where we're heading, and we're heading there. So having another way of making money is a good endeavor, I think. You know, that's the only way I think you can prepare for it. Learn how to grow your own food, be self-reliant. And if you live in cities like that, it's probably going to be very difficult. So hopefully you have enough time to change your lifestyle to get yourself out of those cities. Go into a, a little bit different, uh, a rural setting, you know, away from the, the congestion of city life. Because that's where there's going to be a lot of crime, a lot of violence. It's going to be unsafe there. And things are going to change from a industry standard across all, all industries. They're going to be reducing the necessity for people. And what you don't realize is when they told everybody to go home and work from home, they were beta testing a lot of things that were being ran without people being on site. So a lot of the jobs are going to fall away. I mean, even, you know, look at McDonald's and they poison you with that garbage. You drive through and you pay too much for poison. They're moving to restaurants that only have one person in them and they're all basically robot driven. Sounds like the Jetsons, right? <laughs> Cartoon from the, the 80s. Think about toll booths when you were driving before. You go through toll booth and you get the people that you would give the money to and they let you go through. Go across the bridge or go through a section of town or a specific highway. They ain't there anymore, are they? I didn't think about that until I was driving down to Florida. I was thinking to myself, you know, I wonder what those people are doing today that used to be in those toll booths. And you know, what are they doing now? And every industry is being shook up because they're preparing for less people. Less people, less headache. You don't have to pay health insurance for them. You don't have to have any kind of, you know, extra this or extra that. And they never call out of work. They never go on maternity leave. So people, from a business owner's perspective, is a need right now. But there's a massive move for people not to be needed. They want artificial intelligence. They want automation. And that is going to make you redundant. You're talking about... Taking away natural gas hookups in New York, madness. They're talking about no diesel engines in California, madness. Like these things are all eventually coming to, oh, well, look, look what happened. The Dutch, the governments are paying, buying out the 
farmers out there for 100 or 120 percent of whatever the value is. Why? Food is going to be controlled. You guys were laughing at me years ago when I was talking about it, but you got to take a step back and look at everything they're doing. Cow farts are not going to change the atmosphere. Okay. <laughs> That's what they're saying. We can't have too many cows. Can't have too many cows. I probably should have warned you when we were transitioning into the tinfoil. Some of you are like, what the hell does it have to do with trading? It has everything to do with it because it's going to be in your house. All these things are going to be impacting you. It's going to impact your life. It's going to impact how you live, what you pay for, what you can you know, acquire, how you feed your children, yourself, if you don't have children. All these things are going to be major impacts in your life, whether you choose to believe it right now or not. It's going to be an impactful event. And you got to prepare yourself, make yourself ready, make your house ready. Non-perishable foods. A way for you to, you know, grow your own food. It may not be feasible, but you got to do whatever you can, right? What's the point of making all this money if you just ride around in Lamborghinis? Lamborghini ain't going to feed you. Lamborghini isn't going to. If everybody is paying attention, you know, they're trying to put you know laws in place that no combustion engines are going to be made after 2025, and in 2020, I'm sorry, 2030, everything should be electric. Meanwhile, the, the batteries in these things, what do you do with them when they're no longer any good? You can't just you know, recycle them. They're not all, all this green stuff that everybody talks about. You know, look at windmill blades. They're burying them and they never disintegrate. Does that sound like a good use of resources? It's all lies. All this stuff, everything you're told is a lie. Everything about the market you've been learning. From all these books and writers and teachers and things that they talk about on, on the news, it's all lies. You're being lied to. You're being manipulated. You're being controlled by misinformation. And having a lot of money in a world that's changing to this degree might not be enough. And that's my concern. I'm not sleepless at nighttime over it. My faith isn't in money. I've been poor before and I don't care. I had a fish, I had a cook, I had to do all those types of things. I don't need to live on filet mignon. I don't really eat it much. But the point is, I don't need to have a high jet set life. I don't need to have that. For some of you that's never had it, you want it so bad, you're willing to do whatever shortcut there is. But I'm talking about things that you might not be aware of because. When it starts happening, it might scare you. It might make you stressed out and scared or stressful mindsets can't trade efficiently. You'll be consumed with this in terms of anxiety. So if you're told about it in advance and you can make your house ready as best you can, I'm hoping, and this is the only reason why I'm talking about it, I'm not trying to scare anybody. It's not meant to be fear-mongering. It's meant for you to just prepare for it. However you feel that you can and how you can, that's all I'm and trying to inspire in you. I'm not telling you to resist or go riot at your presidential palace or White House or whatever, because that stuff isn't going to do anything. That That's not going to do nothing. It's going to get you in trouble. And that, that's what you want to avoid. Rising up or insurrections and things, that's what they want. They want that to happen. They want that very thing to happen because that's going to allow them to usher in more controls. Control measures with finances and civil control mechanisms. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can only go outside at this time. Down in Baltimore, I don't live in Baltimore. I've never lived in Baltimore. But locally, they have a curfew. If you're this age, you can't be out past this time. If you're this age, you got to be home by this time unless going to work. Really? You Are you going to be comfortable with that? You can go outside at this time, but not this time. <laughs> it's like we're in a weird science fiction movie that keeps getting worse. And just because the World uh, World Health Organization, who removed the COVID restrictions, and now they say there's no more pandemic, um, there wasn't a pandemic. You know, they had ran a beta test on things to see how far they can get things done. 
And now they have conditioned. There's people still driving around in cars with the windows up with masks on. And that's a that's a unfortunate thing. I look at my wife all the time. She sees it too. And she's like, they watch the news and it scares them. And they're not old. <laughs> I can understand an elderly person thinking, okay, you know, I can't afford to catch anything. You know, it is what it is. I understand that. These people are young. And your mind is a battlefield. And they're coming at you with everything now. War, rumors of war, they're going to invade. What happens if this and what happens if that? They're trying to scare you with weather balloons. Oh, there's a balloon flying over top of the country. Look, you think China or any other country would use a balloon to, to navigate and take pictures? of? They can do that with satellites. They got so, there's so many, there's like 30,000 satellites above our, our planet right now. You think they can't scan through and see what we have in terms of military bases and how much artillery we have this there? That balloon stuff, it was just a distraction. Watch what they do with that information. It's going to come back up again. You're going to see more of that silliness. Oh, we shot down an unidentified object. Oh, yeah? Right away, everybody's thinking it's E.T., some UFO. Like it's, they're, they're literally wearing us down with all this nonsense, constantly keeping you distracted while they're bankrupting every country's currency to usher in a digital currency where they have complete control of you, how you spend your money, where you spend your money. And if you don't listen to them and comply, they just turn it off. What are you going to do? What are you going to do if they do that? What, what, kind of, what kind of response are you going to have for it? You're going to get angry. You're going to go on social media and complain, and then they're going to do what? Affect your social credit score because you did that too. It's a way of taking away free speech. It's a way of controlling people. And guess what? There's nothing you or I are going to be able to do to stop that. There's nothing, zero, that you're going to be able to do to stop it. So losing control of yourself emotionally over it, either by fear about it right now or getting angry when it happens, you have to find a way to stay in control of yourself and shut your mouth. Not because you're licking the boots, but because why make a target of yourself? Especially if you have kids, if you have children, if you have a family that's depending on you. I don't want to have any more than what's already going to come. And I, I don't hold back what I think. I say what I think, and I, it, it, it is what it is. So if I remain on social media, all I'm going to do is put a target on myself. And just look around, see what they're doing, people. I don't, you know, I've always been controversial in trading, but I don't want to be a reason for people to feel like they got to reach out and touch me and, and upset my family life, my, my personal life. I've already had a, a, enough intrusions in that from goobers. But uh, the world's changing, folks. You know, it's changed you know, 20 years ago. You just haven't recognized it because the progression was very, very slow. Small incremental movements. It's not perceived by the average person because they keep you distracted with the football games and all the sporting events and all the drama and keeping up with the Kardashians. Giving, giving you all things dramatized over about other, th other people. Not recognizing that your world slowly becomes smaller and smaller. And it's about to become even smaller. Big population reduction. That's their plan. So, anyway, it probably doesn't feel like a, a, a good way to end a Twitter space. <laughs> but uh, it, these are all things I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about these things while I was driving. You know, I had the a headset that I could have been talking while I was driving and it would be completely legal and undistracted driving. But I, I wanted to talk about all that stuff and put it on a SoundCloud. But uh, just haven't had an opportunity to do so. So I included it here. Those individuals that were not interested in this kind of stuff, they probably already turned off the, the Twitter space or they're running subscribing me and whatever. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It ain't, ain't going to stop it. But I tell you these things, and I'm not making any money here, okay? There's no ads running. There's no monetization. 
And if you choose never to come back because you heard something that scared you or think I'm trying to push some kind of fear mongering thing on you, don't come back. I'm telling you these things that way you can get you and your household prepared the best way you can. And let it also be an inspiration for you to learn how to do this. Treat it like a business because it's going to get harder for everyone. I have a lot of money and having a lot of money is not going to exempt me from what is coming. It just makes it much more important that I don't talk about the things that I talk about in public forums like this. I'll be deplatformed and there it is. So if my YouTube channel goes down or they take the Twitter account down, or if I put a uh, SoundCloud out on that SoundCloud account, and it talks about these things like this and they take it down, then you know what I've said was absolutely true. And there it is. I won't come up, come back up with another platform to try to be a backup system. I'll just take that as, okay, <laughs> I don't need any more reminder. It's, it is what it is. I've already said all these things anyway, but I'm just trying to be a voice of reason to keep you encouraged to, to keep doing what you're doing. That's all. I mean, it's easy to feel complacent about going to work every day and thinking that that's, that's the American dream. You're getting your bills paid. You're just eking through life and you can make your mortgage or your rent payment. And this is like a distraction to all that stuff. Listen to me or you know, pretending that you're going to eventually be profitable in trading. And that's not what I want you to do. I want you to learn how to do this as a, a means of secondary or primary income to help fortify you know, and put in place the things that you would like to have to make existence comfortable and more bearable because times are going to be harder. You know, doing away with natural gas hookups in New York and doing and banning all diesel engines in California, you know, whether you realize it or not, the things that start in these very, very liberal states eventually find their way into other states, even red states. They may be kicking and screaming and say, that's never going to happen here, but it will. You know, they, they do away with uh, grocery bags. You know, when you go to the store and there's plastic bags, uh, that's it. We're not going to do them anymore. So you got to go out and buy your own totes. I, we do that anyway because I, I, you know, I don't want all those plastic bags in my home. So we buy the reusable nylon. You fold up real small and keep them in your car. When you go to the store, you take them out and you bring your groceries home or whatever it is you bought. And then you have it to be reused. Or they charge you for a bag in the stores. Like if you go to Wegmans here in Maryland, um, I don't know if they have Wegmans in other states. And it's just the store we like to go to. I, I like their food and like how you do their store. But they don't give you, they don't give you uh, bags unless you pay for them. Which you know, it's not a big deal. I, mean, I could pay for bags for you know for everybody, but the point is, it started in California, and it's moved across to other states, and it will all eventually be no natural gas, no wood burning stoves, no diesel engines, no combustible engines. It'll all be green, all electric, and they can all be turned off when they want them to be turned off. Think about it. I saw a video clip short this morning i was eating something before i came on it was a, a short little clip of a guy talking about how a hellcat you probably are seeing this little short but the hellcat um the guy's describing how if someone's going to carjack or steal your car you push this little button on your remote your key file for your car and then they can start the car up but the gas pedal doesn't work okay they're going to smash the car they couldn't steal it, so they're going to smash it all up. But the, think about the, the technology they have there. It'll start, but you're going nowhere. Imagine a world where your social credit score can affect you being able to do that too. They may allow you to drive to and fro to work in your electric vehicle, but on the weekends, they turn off access to it. You don't think it can happen? Look what they've done in China. They tell their people, you can't even leave the house because you've done something that they didn't like. That's what's coming everywhere. Everywhere is going to be like that. That's the goal. You know, it may not be successful in the next year or two, but that's where they're aiming. They're aiming for that before 2030. And that sounds nuts, doesn't it? it sounds insane. And because I'm a person that is prone to say things and not think about the, uh, the ramifications of it, because, you know, I have a heart. You know, I, I don't want any of you going through anything unpleasant and I'm 
sharing my life and my time and my resources and my experience with you in hopes that you'll be able to live a better life and present a better life to your children. That to me is motivation why I do it. And I'm talking to you in a medium that I don't make any money with. And I do that because I want you to trust what I'm saying is only inspired because I want to do well with you and for you. So that way you can do what you're not really equipped to do otherwise. And maybe if I'm wrong, hopefully I am. None of these things happen and you live a better life and your children live a better life because you pass on this information to them. That to me is a rewarding life. That to me is a purpose driven life. That's a, that gives me a, a sense of accomplishment better than making money in the marketplace. Okay. Better than being recognized in the industry as this guy or that guy. I want to be remembered as this, this person talking to you, the person that is investing his time and resources and time teaching you how to do things to be a better person, to equip yourself and your family to not go through as much discomfort as the average person will in the coming years. Cause it's going to get stupid. Like it's going to get really stupid. And I, I don't have answers for all of it. Like it, I've, I've racked my brain for years, you know, all through the COVID crap and stuff. Like I was trying to come up with, you know, ways to navigate all of it and, and what would be an exemption for me to do this or do that. And, you know, I've contemplated, uh, you know, moving to other countries, you know, I, I wanted to go to Ireland and then Ireland started acting up and doing some silly stuff. And I was like, I ain't going there. So it, it's, it, it came painfully obvious that it's not going to be a place where I can go. There's no place that you're going to be able to go that is exempt from it. And now because of Saudi Arabia's willingness to join in with the BRICS nations and also allow their oil to be purchased outside the U S dollar, that's the death nail for the dollar. And I talked about this last summer in Twitter spaces. So it will be a gradual, not an overnight, like boom, sudden the dollar just collapses. Okay. It will be a slow, it has been, it's been a slow dissolving um, erosion of the buying power of the dollar. Even if the dollar were to go up at contract value higher, the buying purchasing power of it won't remain the same. And it doesn't make sense for someone that's new. There's like, it doesn't make sense. Um, just look at what you're doing right now. When you go to the store, when you when you buy groceries, um, it, it costs a lot of money. You know what I used to purchase for me and my family. Uh, we would I, when I purchase food, I, I I purchase one month's worth of normal consumption, and then I replenish my food stores in my pantry so long-term pantry and in the average every day like milk and eggs and stuff like that my wife will grab that on a week-by-week -week basis but your bill probably is you know much more than it has been in the past too but it, it costs me about 12 to 1300 dollars to buy the food that we put in for a full month you know i have teenagers that still live with me they eat up a whole, a whole bunch of stuff and over the course of a, a you know a month you know, every meal I put dog food into that too, by the way. So it kind of factors that in too. But um, oh, look at dog food. If you have a, a pet, we used to uh, spend like $10 for one case of food for one of our dogs. Now it's more than doubled. So I'm sure the folks that are out there that are listening that haven't found profitability yet, you know, they're really trying to get to a point where they can make more money, you know, and, I get it. And that motivates me. Like that keeps me going to try to find ways to make it easier for you to learn how to do this. And hopefully this presentation has helped in that regard in terms of limiting your exposure. Don't look at it as holding you back because it's easy for you to wrestle with this. This guy just outlined this many opportunities in a day. So why is he telling me only pick one of them when it would make more sense for me to be able to win here, win here, win? Because you're assuming as a, as a new student that you're going to win all the time when you're not as a new student, you don't know yourself. You don't know the market. Well, and it's foolish for you to think that you're going to be successful that fast right out of the gate and be able to trade every session, every opportunity in a 24 hour window. You can't. So learn one of them 
Pick one that fits easily inside your personal lifestyle right now. That way, when all these things, if they do start to get worse, then the stresses that come with it, they won't compound you into doing something outside of the model that you had to have. That has proven to you by then, hopefully, that the results that you're looking for can be obtained just in one of these sessions in the day. You only need one of them, just one. And if you get really good at one, then venture into another one in addition and then slowly grow in that one. And over time, you may be able to do something in every one of them, but you can't do it in your first year. You can't do it in your first two years or three years. It's going to take you time to get real comfortable with working with a full daily range. And that shouldn't be a goal for everyone, but that's mastery. If you want to know what mastery is, is you can go in every single one of these time windows and find a setup and engage it and take it out. But unfortunately, young men are going to take that as a challenge and try to do that in their first six months or their first month or their first year. And it's going to hurt them. And that's why I'm telling you not to do that because you can set yourself back in your progress and your development by doing something like that because it'll build in all this scare, fear, anxiety, performance anxiety, basically, because you've done something more than, than is required. To make money, you have to do something that repeats, that you can control risk with. You can limit the amount of risk exposure you have to it both in time in front of the charts and in the market and with the assumed risk in each individual trade. So in the beginning, you want to limit that to a very small degree of exposure, not doing a lot of trades because think about it. You're in the beginnings of that. So everything that's painful is going to be extremely exaggerated in your mind that that loss was way worse than it really was. You know, if you're trading with a small account underfunded, and you lose 200 bucks, that's like the end of the world. Like, man, I could have done something with that 200 bucks, blah, 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 versus losing 200 bucks and knowing that you don't have to hurry up and run away and get into another trading setup that same day or that same session to get it back. Otherwise, you're viewing yourself as a failure or never going to be able to do this. It's a lot of growth that goes through the first stages of learning how to trade and rushing into live money or a funded account that's passed and you can get withdrawals and, and, and payouts from a, a funded account company and still not know how to trade. You can get lucky, get a payout and still not know how to trade. So you don't want to discover that painfully. You want to know that you're absolutely bored with one of these times of the day. You know that like the, like the back of your hand, you know what you're looking for. You're not going to deviate from that. You're not in a rush. You're going to wait patiently for the setup to come to you because you're anticipating it. You're not waiting for the market to react to what price has shown you. You're not doing that. There is a difference, okay? There's a, there's a, stark, there's a stark contrast between anticipating something and then reacting. Knowing what you're looking for, engaging it, managing that trade to, to the end, impeccably managing risk the entire time that's your goal that that's the primary focus for you as a student of mine I, I don't care what anybody else does and how they teach under my wing that's what you're trying to do and then you grow gradually because you have to understand that even making money is scary it's it, it, the people that would have a, a saying that would be against that i promise you they have never made any money the ones that get on social media, you know who I'm talking about, all these talkers. Yeah, I'll make this, I'll make that, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. When you're making money for the first time, that's going to be very scary. And you're going to freeze. And you're going to feel an overwhelming desire just to close the trade. More so than I'm going to hold it and see how much it's going to pay out more. You're going to be fearful of your stop loss. Is it going to go down and hit my stop? And it's probably going to be you know, a significant distance between where the market is right now while in unrealized profit and your stop loss will be pretty, pretty far away from it. Even if it was to stop you out, it would still be in profit. But you're going to start wrestling with this. Do I get out here? What happens if it goes down to my stop? What happens if it goes down 
two more ticks and it does. And then you're thinking, oh no, oh no, what do I do? What do I? And you're literally going to be arguing with yourself. The whole time you're in unrealized profit and you're not going to stick to the model. The limit orders, you know, eight ticks or eight, you know, eight handles higher still hasn't got there yet. But you're in 12 handles of unrealized profit with a three point lock of, you know, if you get stopped out, you made three handles. But you're going to be wrestling because you've never been here before. You're going to be wrestling with, what do I do? What do I do? And it's painful. It's scary. And I teach, as soon as you feel that, take half off. If you still don't feel better, close the entirety. Get out of it. You have to have gradual progress. And that is an experience that even if it goes back and stops you out, you've saved yourself from that experience and it'll feel good. If it continues and goes for your target, it's okay. Because you were a part of that trade and you still took a large portion out and you removed yourself from that emotional turmoil. Because if you stay in that state of mind while you're trading, you can't effectively manage risk. You cannot effectively manage the trade. And you're worrying about the what if instead of worrying about what is. Is the market showing me that it's still on the right side? Is order flow still confirming? If I'm bullish, is to do down close candles support price? If it goes into the down close candles, is it going past the 50% mean threshold? If it does and starts closing below that, there are warning signs. Doesn't mean completely bail on the trade. It just means, okay, what's the next two PD arrays below that? If I'm bullish and I'm long, is price not being supported by down close candles? If that happens to not be true, then and only then, you don't worry about it. You close the trade and you're happy with it. Be content with that. And you'll see many times that you did the right thing. But you can't appreciate what I just said until you go through back testing and then do tape reading and then do demo trading. And you've been there. You've seen it. You've experienced it. Now you understand it and see it before it happens. You anticipate it. But if you're trying to just jump over top of all that stuff and go into live fund trading or getting passed with a funded account and trying to be able to trade a funded account and get withdrawals and payouts by these companies and not know what you're doing, you're going to fail. And you won't understand why you're failing, which will also be a, a great deal of negative impact in how you think about trading, how you think about yourself as a trader. All those things are going to be paramount to what you do in the next set of trades. And it's going to create nervousness, anxiety, and you'll have fear of getting into a trade. It'll completely lock you down and you may have just made money, but being in a, a, a trade that's making you money and not understanding what it's like to be in that position, it's a scary feeling. And the only reason why that occurs and the answer to that solution being found in back testing, condition yourself, seeing it, then tape reading, looking for it without pushing the button getting bored with how many times you're able to see it and then venturing in slowly with demo trading for months. And you can't, you absolutely cannot take yourself and I'm going to shortcut it and skip all that part. You can't, you can't do it. So hopefully I've given you a ability to focus in on specific times of the day, time-based setups and models that you can employ and use these as as a rule-based idea going into the 24-hour trading day and find your unique model to start with in these specific times. Hope you found this one insightful. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I'll have something for you tonight on YouTube with the new week opening gap. And until I talk to you then, be safe.